All right, my friends. Happy Thursday to everybody. We have a special guest in the house, Phil Jones from Massimo. How are you doing, my friend? How are you, Gene? It's always fun to come and hang out and talk to you. It's been too long. I think the last time we've done some type of a collaboration together was at Cedia last yes. year. Yes, yes, yes. So it's fun. To, it's fun to, to talk and uh, and and what's nice is we this, this, we continue to launch new products and it's nice to come and spend a little time talking about them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. You guys have announced a flagship AVR, the Cinema Thirty for Marantz, the replacement to the SR eighty fifteen. And as you guys know, when I reviewed the SR eighty fifteen, I deemed it as probably one of my favorite um, Atmos receivers of its day. And we're talking just a few years ago, but that was a beautiful piece, Phil. I really enjoyed that piece. 11 channels of amplification, real good media amplification with a toroid. I think I bench tested it at 100 watts a channel with seven channels driven. Mm -hmm. And you guys give the 70% guarantee, 70% of the two channel rating, which is 140 watts. You give it for five channels. I actually verified it for up to seven channels. So I love the fact that Japan engineering is very conservative in their ratings. You guys are really transparent about that. And another cool thing, just to give more props, is you guys have shared with me measurements that I can't share here <laughs> on the Cinema 30. It's IP, it's Roswell technology. But one thing I love about you guys is when I measure your products, I send you my test reports. You guys go back to Japan. You have the same audio test gear I do, the audio precision. You verify, and we're always within like a dB or a fraction of a decimal point of distortion of each other when I publish, and I, I love that. Yeah, well, one of the things, like, the whole goal is to is to build the, the highest performing product that you that you possibly can and continue to advance. It's just like, if you look at a, a, a 2019 911 Turbo, that is a spectacular car, but there's engineers are always driven to deliver even higher performance um, along the way. And the main thing that we have to get across, if you talk to our sound masters, is it's more about um, relaying the creator's intent more than the specs. Sometimes high great specs is gonna do that. But the whole goal is why do you listen to music? Why do you watch a movie? It's to be emotionally drawn into that what you're listening to, to, to experience what the creator ex and intended for you to experience. So that's our number one goal. And a lot of times that is reflected in, in measurements, but that's the goal of every single sound master and engineer at, at Morant. Gotcha. So we got some slide presentations here. You guys have sent me some information and I've tried to disseminate as best as possible and definitely want you to elaborate on things here in case there's any mm -hmm. questions. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Here mm -hmm. we go. Okay, so the big question is what performance advantages does the Cinema 30 have over the SR8015? Because that was already a good platform. And what you could see in this top view of both units with the Cinema 30 on the left side and the SR8015 on the right side is look at the difference in the HDMI boards. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I see more heat sinking and more <laughs> stuff going on there. Yes. So if you look at the 8015, it supported um, a single, maybe one HDMI um, in and two HDMI outs at 40 gigabits per second. We keep talking about 40 gigabits per second. Yep. We like those big fancy numbers, right? That's basically the ability to extract all the performance from a from a traditional, from a consumer panel at, at 8K60 and 4K120. You need 40 gigabits per second. Now, if you start trying to add more video inputs, there still isn't a board that's available, a single board that will allow you to support, you know, six, seven, eight outputs at 40 gigabits per second. So instead of using one HDMI board, there's actually three HDMI boards in here and a matrix switch. And that's what wow. we had to do to ensure that you were gonna get um, all of those, all of multiple 40 gigabit HDMI um, uh, 8K inputs. So that's why that board is gigantic. And of course, that's a lot of, that's a lot of processing, hence yeah. the big heat sinks on it. And uh, you know what's great about the fact that this is under the Massimo umbrella is this technology is shared across multiple platforms. So you see this very similar board, not only in this product, but you see it in the AV10, which is your flagship mm -hmm. processor, and you mm -hmm. see it in the Denon A1H. 
Exactly. And depending on what you're looking at, like if you get a device, if you get a um, Marantz receiver with maybe less outputs, you may only see um, the board may have less stuff on it because you'll mainly need maybe two HDMI switchers and a matrix switch. And you go to three and a matrix. So as you add more inputs, you have to add more to the board. Because people look at some of the models and they go, why is there such a big jump from like a yeah. Cinema 50 to a Cinema 40? And, and the second I pull the lid off and you just see the video board as just one of the differences, you go, oh, you know, I get it. Just to add one or two more HDMI inputs, it is a it, it costs a decent amount of money because now I got to put a build a much more elaborate board in order to do that. So the board is um, and you could see the difference in the video board um, between these two. And, and that's the thing. But if you're not in the 8K or you're fine with mostly 4K sources, you may be that may not be the reason why you move from an SR8015 to a, to a Cinema 30. So there's other things that are audio based um, that you may want to gravitate to that would still encourage you to move from an SR8015 to a Cinema 30. And I think it's an important perspective to note like this. Yeah, the price went up a little bit. So the 8015 was 4000 retail, the Cinema 30 is 4500. But the amount of HDMI processing and, and the general processing overall has gone up substantially. You could spend 20 or 30 grand on a dedicated pre-pro and it doesn't have this sophistication of HDMI. Literally yeah, doesn't. Exactly. I mean, I have a I have a really nice um, um, four-in, uh, two-out um, AV, um, uh, AV Pro ma uh, 8K matrix switch and it costs a thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, so so if you think about um, how much it would cost, that piece alone easily justifies the um, the cost. And then, of course, right. we got more powerful DDA, um, DSP processing because the receiver does more. So so you need to have more a bigger a bigger brain in the in the unit. Two thousand MIPS on the Cinema Thirty versus sixteen hundred, and you did it with one chip instead of two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you got to remember, like, oh. think about a computer, computer chips. If you go from yeah. an Intel i7 to an Intel i9 Extreme, it's still one chip, but the processing is getting faster and more and more powerful. And remember, you're trying to do multiple things now because we're adding um, uh, multiple room compensation capabilities for subwoofer, you know, um, independent subwoofers. For, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. So a bigger processor just means that we're ready to continue to add stuff to the unit. So I was just, you know, I'm kind of a an old vintage game geek and I was looking up when I saw this 2000 MIP comment in your slides, I was like, <laughs> I wonder how many MIPs my Commodore 64 was back in the 80s. It was a half a MIP. So this is 4,000 times more powerful than my Commodore 64 in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's probably more powerful than a laptop you probably could have bought a year, to, a couple of years ago. Yeah, so, no doubt. And it's and that's just the video processing and room compensation and um and and I actually it's the the audio processing and room compensation and and all of the stuff that goes along with it. So in this slide, we're talking about just the DSP advancements. Mm -hmm. um, I guess faster SD RAM is important, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got a higher clock frequency on your processing, like you said before. Mm -hmm. And now we've got 13.4 channels of processing. So even though it's an 11-channel internal amp, you could add a two-channel amp and you could support a 9.4.6 mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. configuration. Couldn't do that on the SR8015. Well, you could, except for the two. You only had two sub outs. Not you only four. had two subwoofers instead of four subwoofer outs. Yeah. So yeah. the goal is somebody. A lot of times people go, well, you know, Marantz doesn't doesn't make a bigger um, integrated amplifier than um, integrated AVR than the Cinema 30. After you get to this point, then we start talking separates, right? Yeah. But someone who buys at this point may decide in the future that they want a little bit more. And we all know that the most challenging speakers to drive in your room um, of your passive speakers are going to be your mains. So being able to buy an amplifier in the future to utilize to drive your mains and then now have those additional 11 channels to apply to other, other surround channels in the room means that you have a level of expandability so the unit can stay in your home um, a little bit longer. And the fact that it's got this gigantic video um, amount of processing power means that as we always try to continue to add updates to our receivers via firmware updates that we can, but we can only do that if the brain is big enough, right? So the yeah. fact that the brain is bigger means it's easier for us to maybe add additional features in the future because we have the processing power to support it. 
So I'm going to put you on the spot since we're talking about the brain being big enough and it supports direct live base control where the SR8015 did not. Is the brain big enough to one day support direct art? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you can't skirt that question too long, so <laughs> what I'm going to keep bringing it up. Is, what I will tell you is there's a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline. I uh -huh. prefer, I like talking to Eugene, so I can't tell you what's coming and when it's coming. But I will tell you that um, if you like your, your Cinema 30, it will continue to, um, ad additional performance enhancements are on the way. That's the I like hearing I that. And you know, I'm always going to ask because our peeps <laughs> keep asking me about that. So I, I did something for this slide that wasn't in your original presentation. Um, mm -hmm. You're talking about the Moran Cinema 30 employs a 32-bit hi-fi grade mm -hmm. DAC, D-to-A converters. Mm -hmm. It's a Sabre DAC, but you're not sure of the model on it, right? No, I can't remember off the top of my head. You asked me right now before we started. Yep. I would have to I would have to kind of dig dig through. But the goal is, like I said, when you combine that with the other components, the goal is to give you better performance at the price points we're trying to target. So so Gene, you and I were just talking about that. What was that? Um omakase sushi. Yes. Right. Yes. So the analogy that we were talking about is if you ever go to omakase, think of it as high-end sushi chef's choice right so what that means is the chef goes to the fish market and he looks at what pieces are the best pieces available um, um, for this particular situation this day um, and then and then determines and then based on those he picks the right ingredients to go with it right and what we did which he said at this day at this time to build this type of ABR with better performance than what we had, with the additional um, components to go with it, this was the best DDA converter that we could believe we should put in here in order to hit the price points we're trying to do. And if you look at it and when you measure it, you will see that it performs better than the SR8015. Oh, there's a huge difference in performance from what I saw with your measurements. And in fact, my point in this slide is I brought in my AV10 measurement for mm -hmm. SNR mm -hmm. or dynamic range. And it's almost on par with the, the Cinema 30 is almost on par with the AV10. It is very close. So the mm -hmm. fact that you were able to put AV10-like performance into this receiver, to me, implies you probably have the same DAC or yeah. something very similar to it. And you've made a huge jump in performance over the already good SR8015. Exactly. Well, the main difference to step up to an, to, um, to an AV10 is, of course, is additional video process. I mean, additional... Um, surround sound processing and the expandability of separates versus um, a one, an all-in-one box. But the performance-wise, um, if you're looking for a single box solution, it's outstanding. So here you have a block diagram that just shows you how the DAC is laid out. And there's more stuff going on here with the, you have the separate current output DAC and the current to voltage conversion. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at the 8015, it wasn't this elaborate. Right. There's a lot more going on in this topology than there was with the 8015. Yeah. And I wish I had thought about it because I actually have components or pieces um, in boxes. And, 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 it, and one of the things when I, that I'm lucky enough, I have an opportunity to go to, to, go to Shirokawa um, at least once a year. And it's yeah. nice to sit down with the, with the, with the, the Morant engineering team and the sound master. And they start passing around the old board versus the new board. And they're trying to, um, uh, uh, shorten signal paths and and uh, separate noise um, components that generate noise from components that don't and 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 it's just fine tuning, continuous fine tuning, uh, and that's what you actually see. So a lot of times, the where they lay it out is based on based on their research. They figured out a better way of doing it to give you a um, a, a cleaner, more direct signal. Gotcha. Let's move on here. So there's more here on. So you guys, what's what really differentiates the Morans from Denon is the fact that you have their your proprietary HDAM PCB boards. Yep, hyperdynamic amplifier modules. And what what would you say the what's this largely responsible for? Is this is this what's responsible for the sonic signature that Morans is trying to? differentiate itself over Denon? Yeah. Why does someone need HDAM? Well, well, the two things it does. The first thing is um, most of the time you use these to, to basically increase small signals into bigger ones. So whether you'll see them in 
Um, phonal preamps, you'll see them in the preamp stages. You'll see them even in amplifiers to boost signal after they come through from the from the you know RCA inputs, right? The whole goal is to boost those signals. Normally, you can do that with what's called an an op amp. Well, an op amp, they, there's very very good ones out there, but but those op amps are have a certain sonic signature, and you try to fit them into your particular um, application by the other circuits that go around it. Um, utilizing HDAMs and, and individual components allows us to better um, adjust for that. Um, it also um, allows a lot of times better performance, more dynamic range um, and things like that. So not only does it give it its sonic signature, it's often why they measure better, they can measure, they'll measure better because of it. Um, because you're using discrete components that can be optimized. Yeah, and there's a lot more components involved, a lot, lot, lot more complexity in design to do that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we always say more, um, if you look at a Marantz, it's um, because it lives at a little bit of a higher price, it lives at a higher price point than our other um, great brand. Um, a lot of times, if, you, if I was going to make it simple, I'd say more parts, <laughs> um, some, and, and a lot of times higher end parts, um, is the run of reasons why you command it commands a premium. Yeah. So here we're looking at the analog PWB uh, between the Cinema 30 on the left and the SR8015 on the right. And shorter signal paths are really good for eliminating noise and pickup mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just see there's more stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did they give you like a spiel on what were the advantages here in this setup? Like, did they redo the volume ICs, or is it just? I'm sure everything was kind of refaced to match what's in the AV10. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff comes from um, research for the the AV10, and um, like I said, the main thing was they look at the amplifier topography, determine um, what's the most precise layout. Then you combine it with the new the the, the DSP convert the DSPs we're using and the and the DACs that we're using. And you just get this is just a layout that they that they that they settled on, um, and they work on this pretty 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 heavily until they get it to the point where you know the soundmaster Ogata-san is happy with its overall performance. So that's why the AV10 is such an important product because that was kind of the benchmark, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything after that was kind of based on trying to preserve as much of that performance into other platforms that trickle down to. Yeah, that's the best way to think of it. I mean, most people don't go out and buy a GT3 911, you know, Porsche. But the research that goes into that flagship car, a lot of that character, a lot of the things they learn um, trickle, trickle down. We all know engineers are never satisfied. Um, they are always looking for ways to do it better or differently or, or improve the sound. Um, I'm not as crazy. You are far more technical when it comes to how all the different points, and even I am. But 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 when you when I talk to these guys, it's just that that's their whole pursuit. It needs to be cleaner, and it needs to be it needs to sound the it needs to be cleaner, and it needs to um, be musical. Just inspire emotion. If no. I don't care how clean your signal is, if it's dry and dead, and it doesn't it doesn't make you um, you know stir you emotionally who cares it's about it that's what we're trying to do here is, is make you when you sit down and watch that movie or you play your favorite song feel something right that's the whole goal of this yep so here we have uh just showing some components on the power block most uh, from what i'm gathering it's virtually identical in terms of output power but there's been some uh, performance enhancements in layout and again, just to reiterate, I measured, you guys guarantee 70%, which would mm -hmm. be 98 watts a channel with five channels driven. I confirmed in the 8015, I got 114 times five, mm -hmm. 93 times seven at 0.1%, which is really low distortion. Mm -hmm. So this is goodness that you were able to carry that power into this new platform. Because I've seen receiver companies, when they add more features, they shrink power supplies in the next yeah. generation. I've always hated that. And I like the fact that you guys have not done that with your flagship products. This is a already a good stable platform amplifier and you've just gone on and made tweaks to it to make it that much better. That's true. Cause if you think about it, a good amplifier, whether it's five years old to 10 years old or even, or 15 years old is a good amplifier. A lot of teams, a lot of times what separates the, is all of the, the things when we talk about, um, 
surround sound formats and additional capabilities. So if you have a good, um, if you build a great amplifier, um, you may make some, some minor adjustments and tweaks along the way, but a great amplifier is always a great amplifier. It does, it also shows that, that goes back to that um, Omakase thing. I still wanna keep that amplifier Plus, I got to give you four sub outs. Plus, I got to give you more video capabilities. Plus, I got to give you a bigger DSP to do all the other things you want to do with it. You know, and, you know, I got to I got to make sure that I don't make it too much more expensive than the previous model. So all yep. of that kind of goes together. And, and like I said, I uh, and that's how it is. This is fine balance between parts and things like that. So this slide basically talks about um, suppressing mutual interference with some of the enhancements you had. And I just wanna show like in my measurements of the 8015 from a few years ago, which measured great, mm -hmm. the channel to channel consistency was a little off on some of the channels. The distortion near the knee was a little higher than the front channels. I'm guessing that you guys saw these measurements and you're like, you know what, we're gonna pimp this thing out and we're gonna make it that much better. So I'm looking forward to getting a Cinema 30 and redoing that kind of test. Mm -hmm. just to see if we have that incredible channel, that really tight channel to channel consistency yeah. and distortion. And we're talking fractions yeah. of a hundreds to thousands place in distortion yeah. at that level. But on the test bench, I geek out and I love seeing, you know, lower distortion, lower noise <laughs> with, new, with new products. Well, I will say that when we go to like, there was a bunch, like I said, Gene got a bunch of uh, images of measurements that he, that uh, we, he's got to measure himself because they, they're like, they're less, they're behind the curtains. But when we go to Japan, we actually see that stuff as well. And, and they, they literally say, here's the old one. Here's the new one. Here's the old one. Here's the new one. And I will tell you that it is very, very rare that um, a new model, like a cinema 30 is, does not exceed the performance of the previous model. Love that. Love that. Power amp section for the first time using copper plate for the power amplifiers unit in the Marantz AVR. So there you see the Cinema 30 versus the Cinema 40. And I'm assuming the SR8015 didn't have that copper plate like that, did it? No, no it didn't. Yeah. And so copper is a noise reducer. Helps noise reduce reducer. Noise. Yeah. It's a beautiful layout, man. I mean, you guys, I really like the monolithic construction that you've yeah. been doing on the amplifiers lately. Yeah, yeah, I will tell people that all the time. If you want to, if you really want to get an impression of um, the the care that goes into something like a Cinema 30, if you ever have the opportunity to pull the lid off a of Cinema 30 and a comparable um, uh, AVR from a lot of other brands, the mm -hmm. clean, how clean the interior is designed how well laid out everything is, how how short the signal paths are, are noticeable when you pull the lids off. I actually saw that one time where we actually, the engineers did that. They had multiple receivers and they yeah. had the lids off at the same price point. And as soon as you looked in there, it was just blatantly obvious about the care they take um, in laying everything out. I mean, there's some competitors of yours that don't give you the same quality of amplification, even for the high channels. So mm -hmm. the fact that every amplifier is the same, whether it's mm -hmm. a high channel or front channel or surround channel, it's all monolithic. It's all the same modules, basically. Yeah. Well, it, it, it actually, one, it gives you better performance. It's better efficiency for manufacturing, yeah. you know? So, so I know that a, a Cinema 30 gets 11 of these boards, <laughs> not two of these and three of those. You know, yeah. so, so it just, it just, it just leads to it. And of course the copper, I love the copper is just kind of a, a thing as you move up the food chain, um, copper and built in Shirakawa, which is now the cinema 40 is also built there as well, but cinema thirties and, and, um, cinema 40, cinema thirties, things like that. So just so people understand this, the Shirakawa factory for Massimo, or I should say Marantz and Den, and that's like your premier manufacturing plant for the prestigious products for the very best of that mm -hmm. you guys offer that's yep. where the like the denon 5805 was made i always talk about that because that's still my favorite receiver yep. ever made yep but, uh class a class a class delta, a, uh, delta yeah. monos um hand wind we hand wind um high-end uh um uh, uh, phono cartridges we do handmade super high-end denon headphones um, it, the engineering facility is in, is right up the road. It's the, the, the amount of craftsmanship and the care is, is amazing. It's, it's, 
Yeah, and that's what I love about the place is every time I go, it's just the cleanest, nice, um, more precise, most precise um, amount. This like even just watching the people wrap the the pro the, uh, the the AVRs as they come off the assembly line, it's like they're wrapping the most fine piece of Japanese china, you know, um, glassware. The care that they put. I mean, this first thing if you take out a take a Marantz out the box and look at how well. It's I can never wrap the, the the receiver back in the packaging the way that it came out. I thought I was the only one that had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> you open it, you go, oh my god, who wrapped this? You know. Yeah. But but it's just it's just everything about it is just Japanese precision, which I just love. And look, it's important. People may not realize this because they think, oh, it's an electrical component. It doesn't matter. But it's important to have a, a chassis that's very rigid, but also mm -hmm. well damped because you mm -hmm. don't want transformer hum. You don't want mm -hmm. piezoelectric effects, that kind of stuff. So it's obvious by looking at the construction here that you guys have spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, putting effort into that. Oh, no, this whole conversations like I don't even like I have slides they the, the 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 engineers will talk about the feet and why they went from this type of felt to this type of felt or felt with cast iron instead of felt with plastic or or the different compositions of the feet and the screws that screw the feet onto the avr and how that can impact the sound um every little detail is is thought out which i just which i just love because you're paying for a premium product Absolutely. So we just have a super chat here. Hello from Denmark, Cinema 40 here, and MNK Anonymous. <laughs> nice. Thank you for the super chat. Awesome. What time need is new it? Class a, need, uh, yeah, I wonder what time it is over there. Need a new Class A integrated in power amps. Well, there is something coming down the pipe from Class A. I'm not sure if it's still under embargo, but I know actually, we're no, time. actually, I don't think I don't think it is. Pre... Uh, yeah, I don't think it is actually. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to get in trouble. Okay. There, there, we are we be... are getting ready to launch a um, a new Class A preamp. Um, it's still two channel, but it's yeah. it's adding things. It's adding some additional functionality when it comes to things like Heos. So you'll have super high in Heos. And there's more coming, which I definitely don't want to talk about until I'm sure it gets announced. I love the brand Class A, so I'm glad you guys are giving it some love. Yeah, yeah and, and I know that there's, and of course, we everybody knows where's the surround preamp and all that type of stuff. Yep. Um, um, patience. <laughs> <laughs> solid rear board construction. The Cinema 30 adopts newly solid structure that uses boards instead of wires. That's mm -hmm. always good because you reduce mutual pickup and interference and noise mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of times you even see boards so you'll see bar copper bars and things like that just um it's yeah it's, i mean I, I it's so many little minor things you would think it's minor but i guess you would say the sum of the parts right if yeah. you factor in um the rear board construction the, the rear board structure the, the amplifier topography the shorter signal paths the mm -hmm. copper chassis the new feet, which, you know, the old compared to the old feet, all those things, when you add them all up, it's the sum of the parts. And what you end up with is something that sounds better. Well, I just like the fact that it improves reliability. That's really what people are after. You know, when you mm -hmm. buy one of these boxes, this is not a cheap product at 4,500 bucks. <laughs> no, it's and not. It, it's the brains of your entire system. So you want this thing to last beyond its warranty period. Mm -hmm. What's the warranty on the Marantz? Is it five years? Or? I want to say five years now. I have to look. I, let me let me look, but I believe it is five years now. So, so I was allowed to share some of your measurements, and here we have the um, the bench test results for the Cinema Thirty mm -hmm. Filter One versus Filter Two. Now, Marantz recommends Filter One because that's kind of your sonic signature. Uh, your mm -hmm. engineers claim that that's the audiophile sound, but mm -hmm. of course, on a test bench, it's not going to measure as well because the roll off is. Yeah. Well, there's more roll off of 20 kilohertz. You know, there's like we say, there's preference versus reference, yeah. right? And um, if, if you measure a tube amplifier, they a lot of times they're not very good, right? Yeah. But then they sound really good. If I measure the frequency response and the noise floor on a on a phonograph, yeah, it isn't as good as a CD. No. You know, sure. so so eventually it's it's. I would tell you that it's uh, it's which the right filter is the one that you like, right? Mm -hmm. So so yes, the filter two is measures better, but play them and pick the one that you like. And we have tend to find that most people 
a lot of people prefer the smoothness of filter one. Interesting. So I've done that comparison on my AV10 with the per listen speakers that I have. And I don't know if it's placebo because I, especially since I measured it and I know you have a wire to bandwidth for filter two, I keep going back. I, I convinced myself I prefer filter two. I do hear a slight difference. I think there's a little more detail in filter two. And because my eight, my ears are not as young as they were 20 years ago, maybe I like the little extra treble detail. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, some people, um, I'm an older guy like me, I've been, I'm an old car stereo guy too. So yeah. I know my high frequency roll. I know I have a little bit of high frequency roll off so I can see that. Yeah, no worries. So here's a little breakdown. I want to show people just the comparison again. I'm not beating up on the 8015. If you have an 8015, you're in great shape because that's still an awesome AVR. But I just wanted to show the differences that you're getting here with the Cinema 30. You, like we said before, the improved HDMI, you have seven AK mm -hmm. inputs instead of one, or as you say, 40 gigabits instead of one. Mm -hmm. More processing, 2000 bits for 1600. Four independent subwoofer outs instead of two. Two is already great, but four is even better because now you have digital delay compensation and level control for four subs, which we mm -hmm. love. Direct live bass control, which you could not get on the 8015. You, you were mm -hmm. limited to Odyssey, which was not a bad limitation because Odyssey PC is pretty fabulous now. They've, mm -hmm. really, they've really evolved it so well in the last year or two since the PC software is out and you can get the separate uh, calibrated mic as well. But the Cinema 30 has improved DAC, improved jitter and noise. This is all from the measurements that I saw mm -hmm. comparing them, but I, I can't share. <laughs> but I will tell you, <laughs> I will tell you this: the pre-out on the Cinema 30 and the amp sign ad is incredible. Five watts at 90 dB is excellent. The pre-out sign ad is as on par with the um, unbalanced outputs of the AV10. And I'm going to just, you probably won't like me saying this, but this is giving you AV10 like preamp performance minus two channels. I could, you know, I, you could probably can't say that, you know, if you think about it, if I was driving um, a not a not a very demanding pair of speakers. Yes. Um, and I am only interested in up to 11 channels or maybe 13 channels with a um, separate amplifier. A, a Cinema 30 may be perfect for you. Um, if it's you're a, driving something brainer. like we have custom, we have a custom, we have a Bowers custom theater here. We got to throw a lot of power at that. And having a preamp and amplification just means if you need to drive something even more demanding or you want to go up into that 15 channel solution, because we have a 9.6, 9 point, 9.4.6 in, in, our, in our theater, um, then you would go into a, um, an AV10, right? So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I still go back to SR8015. If you only have one 8K source, so you're not really your look. Your your sources are um, an Apple TV, um, a Kaleidoscape, and a 4K Blu-ray player. You don't need the video, right? Yeah, if yeah. you're if you're not if thinking about going beyond two subs, you may not need that. If you're happy with Odyssey, and you don't and you don't think you may or have you don't think that you may need or even desire um, the uh, the ability to do direct direct, you may be good to go now. Yeah. Um, so there is, but the question is, if those are things that appeal to you or the flexibility, of having more brain power for the future. And, um, and like I said, there is, you can see that there is some sonic performance advantages. Um, then you can make that decision if it's time to upgrade. But like I said, you're comparing a, a 2022 911 turbo to a 2014 911 turbo. The other one is the, the I mean 2024. The new one's faster, the new one handles better, but no one's going to look at you and call your car your older <laughs> car a slump, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, so no and that whole thing with an 8050. There's a lot of people that that when you that are that are that would kill to have an 8015. Sure. So I I know the answer to this question I believe, but I'm going to put it up. I'm going to say my answer and you tell me if it's right. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking, why did you guys eliminate? Oh, wait, that's, I'm sorry. That's the wrong one. It's the comments. Going it's juicy. <laughs> why has the, yeah, I think the AV10 is one of my favorite uh, <laughs> home theater components I've ever owned too. Why has the front HDMI connector been eliminated? I'm going to just say, because if you're dealing with 40 gigabits, putting a HDMI on the front means longer signal paths and yep. degradation. Yeah, it was, it was just hard to, to get that signal um, to the front. So, 
if you look at that board, you would have to run basically um, uh, a, a, like a weird kind of extension cable to go from one of the one of the outputs of that one of those board outputs to the front. It's just based on the video signal and how it's done. It just becomes it's a little bit more difficult. I get you because I have a AV10 in my rack, and my wife always wants yep. to plug in the camcorder from to watch yes. my kids video game. So so I understand why you would want that in the front, but it, but just to in order to ensure optimum performance for video on all of those outputs, we just couldn't put it on the front. So can I make a suggestion? Um, mm -hmm. I know you guys have an HDMI dongle, but there's companies like Geffen that make uh, high performance HDMI dongles. Mm -hmm. Maybe just plug one into an unused input on your Marantz and then leave it towards the front of the of the unit. And then you mm -hmm. could plug in stuff if you want to just do quick access. That way you don't well, have to go behind the behind yeah. the AVR. Yeah, that's what I have. I have like a little like a little um, um, AV Pro thing like that. So it's in it's in the because mine's all built into a rack, and I just plug into that because I can't get to the back of the thing unless I pull the entire the entire rack out. So quick question here, and then we're gonna go on because I'm I'm sure people want to know what's the difference between a Cinema 30 and a Denon 6800. We're gonna do that <laughs> little comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any difference here, but maybe you can comment. Is there a newer version of Atmos in the Cinema 30 versus the 8015? I know there's been talks about Atmos supporting wides even for two-channel up mixing. I haven't seen it. Well, well so. you got to remember that Adobe Atmos can support, was it 30 channels? <laughs> 30, yeah, 32, you yeah. know. So the, the pro, the, the, it isn't the fact you need a newer version of Adobe Atmos. You need, at first, the... Um, the, uh, when it came to, uh, you need a bigger processor and a bigger brain and more channel output to, to go. So there isn't, so the, um, so the version of Dolby Atmos that is built into the 8015 versus Cinema 30 is the same, but the difference is now I have directional base capabilities on the yes. SR, um, the, um, the Cinema 30. Now I have four subwoofer outputs on, on, on this particular model, you know, and, and now I have, you know, um, better, a cleaner signal. So I'm yeah. getting, I'm, I'm the ability, I have more of the ability to extract more from the Adobe Atmos file than what, than what I, or utilize more of the Adobe Atmos file than what I could do in the past. And by the way, I got to give you guys props because you're one of the few major AVR companies out there that are supporting Dolby Center Spread for two channel mm -hmm. up mixing. Um, I know because of that Dolby height virtualization feature has removed the center spread. You can't license you can't license both at the same time. There's some limitation there, but somehow you guys got around it, and many of your competitors have not. So the fact that you could still upmix two channel music using center spread feature, and then you also have the Oro 3D upmixer. You guys have really paid a lot of attention to people like me that are two channel guys that want to upmix their music as an option to enhance. Well, the well, I will I will say, Gene, that they do because they um the, our engineers are. What I like about these engineers is our group of engineers is they're always listening to the end user and um, they're always trying to figure out how to give the end users the things they request. So center spread was something that you were running around screaming about. For that. <laughs> Put that back. The other one too was things like when you had IMAX enhanced, why does it always have to cross over my mains? What if my mains can play all the way down? So yeah. we added that. What if I can send my speakers are big enough that I want to be able to send LFE to my mains as well as my subwoofers. You could do that. So all of those, so a lot of those things are coming from the enthusiasts who say, can you add this particular thing? And if they, if there's a way to actually do it in a way that we don't believe it's going to harm the sound or or blow your product up, um, we will, we will, we will actually add those. So there's so that I, so a lot of the, the improvements you see are just based on comments and feedback. So for example, if and me bitching. It has, um, it has uh, amp direct, which means I can switch the inputs. We forgot about that. That I can switch the inputs to amp to a non amplifier direct. What's the one? What is it called now? When you you preamp um, bypass. Pre pre bypass. Yeah. Pre yeah. So when I on the eighty fifteen, I can I can physically hit um, select it, and it will physically disconnect the amplifier stage yep. from the um, the preamp stage. And now you end up with a better signal to run for um, to run the amplifiers. But when I selected that, it was for all of the channels. Yes. Right? 
Now it's assignable. So that was a request. This That's is awesome. great, but what if I just wanted an, an amplifier for my for my front and my center, and I want to use the amplifiers, you know, so now you can just physically connect the fronts and the center. That's a request. So that's one of those things we didn't even talk about yeah. that's available on the Cinema 30 that wasn't available on the SR8015. No, and I appreciate you guys doing that for, because for years I would check the preamp outputs on AVRs, and when I started cranking the volume up, they weren't clipping, but they were getting noisier. And I didn't realize for a while that it was the amp sections that were being overdriven mm -hmm. and that noise was being fed back into the preamp. Mm -hmm. And now on the 8015, you guys put some type of buffer circuit to reduce that. But now you, you also had that preamp disconnect. So now you turned it into a high-end preamp processor. Just yeah. happens to have extra amplification on board in case you need it. So that's exactly. pretty awesome. So, so that's, just a, that's another request. That we um, if so so a lot of things we didn't we didn't we like those are the kind of things we didn't even cover in this slide so there's, so when so there's some functionality stuff that may be so enough for you to make want to move from an eighty an eighty fifteen to a one system. request I have because we talked about the LFE routing and you guys added that because I've been begging you for like a decade and a half mm -hmm. you could actually run LFE to your mains if you want to and mm -hmm. have it to your subs you're the only AV receiver company that allows that by the way so congrats <laughs> but. If you're using Dirac, you can't do that. You can only do it when you're running Odyssey. So go back and tell Dirac you want to be <laughs> able to route LFE into the mains as an option. Yeah, we um, a lot of the companies that we partner with are 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 willing to work with us because theoretically, the when you look at IMAX Enhance, it's it, it's designed to cross over your mains all the time, and we've yep. talked to them, and and now you have the capability of running your mains full range. So, yeah, and, and, when it, and I've been having direct issues with direct art on my storm processor and it's still high pass on my mains and I'm trying to work with them. I'm going to yeah. do a video separate on that. But, you know, you give this kind of feedback and you hope for improvements and you guys are very receptive to that. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that, Phil. Um, I'm going to move on now to the Moran. Yeah, this, this is the big one because people ask us all the time because we always launch. Actually, right now, this is showing you Cinema 50 and um, and uh, a 3800. But this happens a lot of times with Cinema 40 and 4800 or Cinema 30 and 6800. They look the same. I mean, yeah. they have the same specs on the box, but they, and they go, well, isn't it just, and we hear it all the time. They're just the same thing in a different box. They are not, <laughs> okay? Two different teams, two different approaches. Uh, and just like if we go to look at that, that car analogy slide you brought up, um, poor, um, both of these cars are manufactured by the Volkswagen Group, right? They, if you look at them, they both are 252 horsepower. They're both small SUVs. They're built off of very similar chassis. But if you have a chance of driving a Macan and driving a Q5, they drive differently. The driving dynamics are differently different. The um, how the suspension is dampened, the type of brakes that they're using, the, mm -hmm. um, the steering, the, the steering ratios, they're different. So while they started off as um, a using some of this a similar chassis and they have a similar amount of horsepower the way the motor how it revs the way it handles the way it stops the way it goes around corners the way it looks the materials that, that are being utilized are different Porsche had uh, commands a premium so guess what the leather's a little better the parts a little better the brakes a little bigger because they they, they have a premium that they can spend that is not available in the Audi. It does not mean the Audi is not a high performance car. It just means yeah. that the Porsche has a little bit more to get a little bit more out of the vehicle. And that applies with these types of products here. So if you look at it, we always say this, you have the similar functionality, this functionality that every AVR has to have, right? Because a lot of times you get high performance, but poor reliability. So it doesn't matter that your AVR sounds great if, the, if, it, if it has no Bluetooth or the video switching doesn't work or it doesn't support Chromecast or, it, you know, so you have to have things that just have to happen. So yeah. those things are built together. There's one big team that works together to do all of the things that have to happen to make an AVR great. So you don't complain, right? But though, none of those things define what makes this receiver sound different. Then each team is can now focus on the things that they do best. How to make it sound like a Denon and how to make it sound like a Marantz. And they use different parts and they're tuned by different teams with different goals in mind. 
So you end up with a different experience depending on which unit you buy. I love how serious the sound engineers look for Denon and Marantz. And I would pay <laughs> big money to see a live event of them arm wrestling each other. Yeah. <laughs> but the funny <laughs> one is the, the Marantz one is a picture. I'm not sure if I sent you, Gene, of him and all the in the room. We were yes, I remember audio, that one. We were, we were calling him Audio Scarface because he looks so serious. Yes. He's sitting there in this hundreds, this dozens of, of, of old legacy Marantz products from the very first pieces all the way through. And you could tell that he takes his job incredibly serious. And and it is fun. You go you go sit in one room with, with one of them and they explain it and they explain what uh, – say it's cinema – say it's a Model 30 and the – and Ogata-san goes in and explains that product and why he built it this way and what you're going to hear and, the, and, and his whole, whole vision of it. And then you go to Yamaguchi-san and he goes, here's the, you know, um, a, a PM 1700 and this is why we did it this way. And both experiences are different, but they're both great. Yeah. Question for you now on the Marantz, because I know the flagship Marantz has used the toroid and the flagship Denon's used the E-Core. Mm -hmm. Do all of the Marantz cinema receivers use the toroid or do some have the E-Core as well? Like some the have the E-Core. Like but if you look 50. at it, so if I did, if I like, do we have that oh, that overhead shot of both of both the um, a 6800 and a Cinema 30? This is the most yep. radical um, example um, that we could show you because this is, we were just talking about Cinema 30 and, and 6800. If you look at that board, um, that board is the same, right? About, I'd say 50, they said, they used to always say about 57% of the parts between the two models are similar. But a lot of those parts are this, um, this type of stuff. Um, yeah. uh, video boards and video parts and Bluetooth transmitters and things like that. When you lift this off and you get into the other 40%, which is the amplifier topography, um, the layouts, the chassis, that's where they start to differ. Um, at this price point, we use a big toroidal. Toroidals are better, but they're more shielded expensive. too. Yeah, they're they're better at shielding and they're better. We use copper chassis. We have the we have this um, this monolithic, you know, the the monolithic layout of the boards. Um, and then you add the fact that um, we have H amps instead of op amps. So we always say, even if I don't have a toroidal, I'm still using H dams on a Marantz, which means there's more parts in the Marantz and there isn't a Denon. And I like the symmetric uh, layout of the power of the mm -hmm. power amp sections, having the two heat sinks like that. That's just mm -hmm. kind of a hallmark of the flagships of yesterday. Yep. And yeah, but you see here. that it makes the box bigger, you know, cause, cause yeah. that's and heavier. That, it's heavier. It's also deeper because that topography means that I have to make a bigger box, a yeah. deeper box. They all and this isn't, this isn't is new. This isn't new for um, Denon and Marantz differentiation. I covered this back with the 8012 versus the 6500. Mm -hmm. And you could see, <clears throat> excuse me, the 8012 had a bigger power supply caps, bigger tor bigger transformer VA rating, you know, the copper ch uh, chassis, the Teflon tape on the oscillator circuit, all that stuff. So this isn't new. You guys have been doing this for a couple of generations yeah, yeah. to differentiate the brands. Yeah, it's just each, each brand is given a, a range so we go back to our uh, omakase, right? One omakase meal is a hundred bucks. The other omakase meal is eighty bucks. The chef that has a hundred bucks, he has he, the, the ingredients he can pick are going to be a little nicer. Doesn't mean yeah. they eat, that both meals are not going to be great. It's just that one chef has more flexibility to do that. So this is kind of a just kind of lays it out the the numbers, the the prices in euro because I stole this from my uh, oh yeah, my yeah European yeah. presentation. Um, and, but you can see that the, it's a, um, while on paper, a lot of the things, the common things you'll see, um, may appear to be the same, but you can see that there's, that there's differences from the copper plated, um, um, enhancements to the chassis, to the, the Toronto power supplies, to the H dam circuitry for, for preamp circuitry. Um, all that has an, has an impact on, um, how it sounds. Yep. And we know what H and we've talked about hyperdynamic. Yeah, we covered all that. Yeah. yeah, but just think of it: more parts, better parts, um, is one. More parts, more parts, normally higher end parts, um, means uh, is one of the reasons why um, you pay a premium for these things. Yep. So we just want to. I just want to stress that because it still drives me crazy when I when I jump on a board and someone says it's it's, it's the Denon and Marantz are still the, are the same thing, and I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> even if you look at the basic pieces um i could take the the most in, an entry level marantz 
uh, ABR and it's comparable denim. And I can go through and show you some, show you that they are not the same. There are differences. None of none of these products are cookie cutter um, and, and copies of each other. No, I really appreciate you going over the details of that. Um, I think we have a few minutes to just answer some questions if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Yeah, no problem. So this one keeps coming up and I'm going to put it up here. Will your units ever be rune ready as opposed to rune tested? <laughs> I have a slide presentation coming up comparing an Anthem product to the AV-10, and we talk about that in it, so be prepared, Phil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, how do I put this? We, we continuously listen to those requests for people who care about perfor new performance enhancements. Mm -hmm. And because we listen... We continue to do those things. So um, things like Rune Ready is is in the pipeline, um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised when it happens. But okay, that's the best way I can explain. It. I can't tell well, you. I can't tell you when. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you how. But I can tell you that um, we're looking. We're listening and starting to add the type of things that have been requested by guys like Bodhi over here. Okay. Now this one is on the spatial um, Sony Lysus 360 spatial for import DSP steering. You guys do support the Sony oh, 360 yes. spatial. Yes, by the way, if you have a Denon Emirates AVR brand new one, it supports 3D reality, um, 360 reality audio. Get yourself a Amazon Fire device. And if you have an Amazon Fire device and you go fire up title, it will play back in reality 360 audio right now. Through your, through your speakers or just headphones? Through your speakers. Oh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. But you we can't do that with like an Apple yeah, TV. You have to get one of the newer Amazon Fire devices, the Cube or one of those devices. And if you have the right service, um, we will support that via um, uh, and a plug in via HDMI. It will play back in 360 audio through your speakers. So only Amazon, not NVIDIA, not Apple, not um, currently Roku? It's the Amazon. It's the, currently it's the Amazon piece. That's the piece oh, that Yamada-san told me to buy. And he says, any of the new generation of Fire TVs. Okay. I don't have a Fire Stick anymore. I dump I it. guess it's time to go to, I guess it's time <laughs> to go to the Amazon and buy yourself one. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to give Amazon as much business as I can, but here's a, here's a super chat. Uh, will there be a replacement for the AV7706? It's due, Phil. Come on. I, I know. I know. Like, you could see that they're working. Put it this way. We replaced the 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 um uh 60 60 15 70 15 80 15 mm -hmm. and we've already replaced the top guy it's due and and like i said and and their the goal is to replace everything in the lineup with something new so yeah. um i'm not sure when they're working on it but i know that that's probably going to be something that's in the pipeline Look, and I would just say if you're looking to get into separates and you can't afford an AV10 or an 8805, mm -hmm. I would still get the Cinema 30. Get a and, Cinema 30 and put it into preamp mode. And, and just you just get a two-channel amp to power your front speakers and, and use the other amps, at least for the high channels. Because mm -hmm. like I showed you guys before, the preamp outs on the Cinema 30 are no joke. Mm -hmm. They will rival very expensive AV processors. That's how good it is. And I'm like, I can't wait to bench test it. I'm excited about it. Yeah. So, so I know everybody's asking about that 7706 replacement. Yeah. I've seen that before. And here's another one about will HEO support full title flat bit rate sampling rates? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are making a big HEO like, push lately. I feel so. like we should be having a conversation around um, later in the year and half of these things wouldn't be there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But uh, I will tell you that, yes, we are working on HEOS. We just launched uh, a new version of HEOS called U32. That was done a couple of months ago. And the reason why it's called U32 is why there's only been four visual differences. There's been 32 different versions of HEOS in the past um, decade. I will tell wow. you that while we're on 32, there's, a, there's a several more versions coming. And a lot of those things you're asking about. Um, to that I only wish um, Heels did this um, will be addressed. Okay. So we got one here. One final request. Morant's got a facelift. It's time for Denon to get one as well. What do you think about that? I saw a bunch of designs. 
around the corner. I can't show uh -huh. it to you. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> It's right out that door. <laughs> will uh, will you be showing anything like that at the Audio Vice Live this summer? Um, I think Audio Vice Live we're going to be showing some of some some um, some interesting new pieces, um, and some uh, and we're going to give people the opportunity to hear some products that we just announced from a variety of our brands. Like we have okay. um, everything from the the new definitive technology CI speakers. And some other things that are coming. So we're we're going to try to give people the opportunity to hear some of the the newer stuff. And one of, one of the things I love was back in the days, um, it was like you everything was launched at CES. Remember, you, Gene, you and I are old enough to know that you went to CES in Vegas and you saw yeah. everything that um, that was going to come out that year, uh, January seventh. I mean, it was even if it was coming out in October, they yeah. showed it to you in January seventh. Now Things just are just kind of sprinkled into the year, you know, yeah. and you're going to notice there's going to be a lot of things sprinkled into the year this year from, from the Massimo group. I got you. Um, last question here. What kind of upgrades will the AV-10 see? Well, we, we talk about the fact that it has that big brain, right? And a lot of mm -hmm. times um, what limits you to the ability for you to add additional upgrades, whether it's in room compensation or or control or other things like that has to do with how big of a brain you have. And you just talked about the fact that this thing's got a monster brain. So, yeah. so I, I foresee a lot, um, several notable um, performance improvements um, coming to that unit um, in the future. And we, and I will tell you that the way that they've always said, and I talk to engineers all the time, if they can upgrade it via firmware, they will, you know, and they try to do it without um, adding additional um, costs whenever they can to consumers. Like things like licensing. Like for example, if I got to license something, you um, neither we we put that into the price of the AVR at the beginning, or we make it an option for those who want to buy it. So, but most of the time when it comes to so, but most of the time when it comes to performance, we're always trying to improve the unit as the year as the years go on. And and there's some stuff coming along the way that Jen, Jen, Jen and I will be talking about throughout the year for improvements for all of our, for several of our products, including the AV-10. Yep. Last uh, comment. I'm just going to put this up here because it's funny how people miss hear your intent. Nobody's bashing Denon. I love Denon. Yeah. I have a Denon oh, A110. So let's let's go back amp. to that. And I want to yeah. stress this. <laughs> it would be like, I have a Audi S6, 700 horsepower Audi car. Nice car. It yeah. does not suck. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> now, if I'm willing to spend a hundred grand more for a Panamera Turbo, it's going to be a little faster. Yeah. It's going to go around a corner better. But no one's going to look at that S6 and say it sucks. Right. The best yeah. way I can explain it is think of how I always say Denon would be the equivalent of Audi. It's precise and to the point. It's, it's and if you look at an Audi, it's classic. If you look at Denon pieces, like the piece behind me over here, over here, yeah, over there, it's a very classic look, right? It everybody loves the design. It has a very classic design. It's very evolutionary. There's no radical changes in how it looks. It performs extremely well. It measures extremely well, and it's just get to the point, right? When you look at the if you when you look at the um, the Marantz pieces. The Marantz pieces, they have a bigger budget. So if I have a bigger budget, I can put better parts into it. Doesn't so mean the only exception is the Denon A1H does not have an equivalent Marantz piece. The Denon exactly. A1H because It 15. got to the point where they said, if yeah. I'm going to build, right, if I'm already at um, the price of an A1H to build yeah. a, a Marantz that would have that, that would beat that, oh, I'm going to put it in two different boxes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so and the A1H. Denon. We're not bashing. This room here. Is a um, is a definitive technology Denon room, and it yep. is shockingly good. You know, it's just that people want to know why does the Marantz cost more, and there's a reason why it costs more. And then you, as a customer, should listen to both and pick the one that you like, because the best sounding one is the one that you like. And the most powerful AVR you can get today is the Denon A1H. Yeah, an A1H is how would I explain that? 
think of a um, an A1H is a is an absolute beast. Um, you the the A1H's amplifier section makes a, the Cinema 30 amplifier section look like a look tiny, but yeah. it, but it's designed at a different price point. We were talking about the price point, yeah, right? Seven thousand dollars a receiver, what, right? What's the price like, on the A1H? It's like eight grand or some crazy. Seven yeah, grand or seven, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, it's like seven grand. So yeah, you give Denon twenty five hundred dollars more to build their dream AVR, and you have Marantz has forty five hundred. The Denon's going to be bigger, better. So we're not yeah. like I said. It's not about bashing. It's about at these price points, there should be a reason why the more expensive one sounds better. And if I have a a, a Model Thirty, I mean a Cinema Thirty and a and a um, and a sixty eight hundred. The Cinema 30, the engineers had more budget. It's going to be better. But if I put an A1H versus a Cinema 30, the budget that Denon had for that is insane. So, yeah. so it's 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 a it's a bigger batter boy. But if and if you don't need if you don't need 15 channels, go with the Cinema 30. And then if you want to add more power, just get a two channel amp, and it still comes out probably less money than an A1H <laughs> at yeah. that point. And if, if you can handle two boxes, yeah. yeah. But Dean will tell you that Denon always prides itself in building the biggest, baddest, nastiest, you know, insane, um, all-in-one solution. And that's what they like to do. And Moran says when we get to that point, um, we're just going to put them in two different boxes. Yeah. And you guys could check out my bench test results of the, um, the Amp 10 and the AV10. I've done both. I have them in this system right next to me, powering a full per listen system, and it they're phenomenal. They're, it's one of the best processes that I've, I've ever used. Yeah, and I love the fact that you guys keep improving your stuff. Mm -hmm. So, Phil, thanks for dropping the knowledge here. It's always great to have you on. We got to get you here more often. It can't be a three or four month gap anymore. Well, I, I love, like I said, I'd love every as we announce stuff throughout the year. Um, I would love to come back and we can rap about it because there's lots of fun. There's lots of fun things. And then Jen and I sometimes just randomly have conversations about things. Um, and, and I'm thinking sometimes we should just jump on here and just talk about that because that, that kind of stuff is actually kind of fun. Yeah. For people that have been around the industry for decades, we have stories, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks again, Phil. Guys, um, I appreciate if you use our affiliate links below. If you consider buying any of these products, I'll put them down below. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me to suggest video topics. You like this video, hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>